say, huh? Je ne sais pas. Uh, I'm sorry, people are talking to me. And <laughs> yeah. I think um, that was just the software telling us that it started it? recording. Oh, okay. But it, you can make it do it in French. That's very good. I, well, what can I say? A <laughs> man of many parts. Um, wow. Yeah, the, the thing about putting stuff out on the web, from my point of view, I know we've got a lot to talk about that. But on seminars, I talk to people as if they're in my own dojo. And I, I let my guard down, if you like, and I say more or less what I think. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is I've had experiences before where I've done that and then people haven't played the game. They've stuck little snatches where I said, oh, he's an ass," You know, and that <laughs> turns out on, <laughs> and I'm nobody's favourite anymore. <laughs> Not that I care much. But uh -huh. I know, yes, we'll do it. It'll be fun. I'm looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to it since I saw the first one. Um, I thought there's some interesting stuff there. And uh, uh, was it a Canadian guy that was with you on that one? T yeah. Um, um, and he's, I don't know when he got into applied karate as such, but he's really taken it and run with it. And I mean, as me, Bob and Brian have talked about a lot before, a lot of people will see this applied stuff, but they won't actually use their brain. And so you end up with a lot of nice movements from a kata, but they haven't actually got any underlying principles or rules of combat in your case or, or any of that stuff. Oh. Um, but yeah. Andy's one of the ones who's thought about it and he's um, he's, he's taking it on really well. He's a good lad. Well, and, and also, was he the one talking about hikite? <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I think that's uh, been a bit of a been a bit of a bugbear for him. Um, and it always gets mentioned when when Hikite is mentioned, they always drag Andy Allen into it. Um, yeah. So I'm not, yeah, but he understands it. Yeah, he definitely definitely yeah. understands it. I mean, I wrote a huge lot of stuff on articles about Hikite years ago, and got into big uh, arguments with these American seventh dans and whatever they were, um, JKA aficionados. No, you have to do it this way, and it's to add power to the punch and it, the rotation adds this that and the other and they couldn't say well look I can prove to you that I can do the same hip rotation keeping my other hand out in front now why do I have to pull it back well no answer and then you know my favorite repost is very simple how many boxers fight like that you know do you how much money would you put out of your wages on a box that said, yeah, every time I throw a right hook, I'm going to pull my left back to my hip. <laughs> I mean, how many seconds would he last? Yeah. And yet these idiots say, well, he could probably punch harder. Yeah, but he's already been hit in the face by the other hand that he couldn't defend against. Yeah. So I, I really, you, you're getting onto a subject that pisses me off mightily. <laughs> People that reverse engineer mm -hmm. um, was a. I mean, I did when I started. Of course I did, because I had no other knowledge. But being right at the start, I mean, I noticed on that last episode, they said, well, why was Vince into it in the first place? Well, it's because that shit doesn't work. I mean, I was brought up with a sauna and a bunch of Japanese in the dojo. You left your hip down, your fist down there in a fight. You just used to get hit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, they explain that this is for... This is for basics. I said, yeah, okay. And this is for kata. Yeah, okay. And I used to say to him, but you don't fight anything like you do kata or anything like you do basics. And I'm with you all the time. You know, mm -hmm. there's been week after week after month after month, Japanese instructor after Japanese instructor. You don't look anything like the kata. Why? No answer. Well, it's obvious why, because it doesn't work in a fight. You know, I mean, that was blind in the obvious to me. Yeah. I've been on the wrong end of it so many times. And, you know, but the thing is, at the time I was doing my PhD at university and I was a, I'm a good researcher. I, I, I mean, I'm pretty good. And uh, I, I thought, well, I mean, at the time I was researching old Norse language manuscripts to translate them into English from the sagas. But... That's another story. <laughs> but, you know, I thought, well, it's obvious to me. If you want to know the answer, do some research. So I started right back then and there going, getting the old Makimonos, um, getting copies of them. Not that, I mean, online copies from the, the Diet Museum in, in Japan and from places like that. 
um, it was so obvious that what we were getting as karate, Shotokan I'm talking about now, yeah. was nothing like real karate before it came to Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and all you have to do then is analyse what the changes were. So I got to know, I used to travel around with Harada Sensei, who was one of the last people to know Funakoshi alive. He used to carry his uh, gi to the dojo for him when he was a young boy and watch it all happening and this, that, and the other. So I got lots of stories about what Funakoshi actually used to do. And uh, then, of course, I read everything I could. Uh, and it was perfectly obvious that the karate we got from Japan was based on kendo. The, 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 the movements, the straightforward, the straight back, the long stances, the sharp abrupt stops, and the, you know, whatever. Uh, Funakoshi with Under the Influence of Kano, you all know this story. I mean, they just mutilated it. As one of the Gracie brothers said, he, he now practices mutilated jujitsu. And uh, the last article I wrote in the last newsletter was mutilated karate because everything was taken from it that could have damaged anyone. I mean, when I was first started, I used to use weird hand positions. I used to use the, the, the middle knuckle fist here. I used mm -hmm. to hit and hit this way with this. And I even used to use my thumb and even the digit of the thumb for, for eye strikes and point strikes, all kinds of things like that. And, but then the question came, well, but you're in the championships next week. Which of those techniques are you going to use? None of them. Why not? Because you'd be disqualified. Mm -hmm. well, why are you bothering to train at them? I don't know. Well, come on, we need train for the team. So you end up, you, you end up in sport karate training techniques that win points. Mm -hmm. And that means you pull your hand back and you leave your face open when you're punching Chu Dan and the other guy's going Joe Dan. And he might hit you a second after you've punched his stomach but you've won technically because you got there first, even though you have to pick your teeth up off the floor later. To me, that's not winning. I mean, I don't want to win that badly, but I have to give him my teeth. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I get carried away with it. No, but, no, you, know, you know, the thing is, happens, if the, I mean, you, know, you obviously saw it and you thought this doesn't work, which is pretty much, I think, when me, Bob, and Brian all started in the same direction. I mean, I know. I sought you out as someone who knew something because I, I thought this doesn't work. Why do you think so few people do that? <laughs> Ego. People don't like to admit that somebody knows something they don't. Now, just to put it in, 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 in context, I don't mind people doing reverse engineering. If it's not this, if it's not that, well, could it be this? Could it be that? Yes. But the problem is they have no understanding. And I think Andy uh, 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 touched on it right at the start. There are what we call rules of combat. For example, I've just watched a senior Japanese instructor on Facebook doing his version of teaching Bunkai. And some of it, I know where he got it from, because <laughs> I recognize exactly the <laughs> techniques. Um, but the problem is he's standing there and his students are coming at him from Zenkutsudachi, Gedemberai, long stance Oizukis, and he's able to do his techniques and they're only hitting him once. Well, the, the truth of it is, if you train for that to be the situation, what are you going to do when a bloke comes in firing left and right and left and right, left and right as fast as he can? You really think that's going to work? That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You cannot fight standing still. It's just the rule. If you stand in front of a train, you'll get knocked over by the train. I mean, it is not rocket science. But these people that reverse engineer things, well, that's it now. We've assumed that, okay, Agayuki now is a strike to the underside of the jaw. That's fair enough. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're doing it from the front without having used the rules of combat and what's the most pertinent one there, knock him off balance first and then move to a position of advantage move all the catters that were the penan catters do their techniques at 45 degrees there's no argument about it mm -hmm. when funikoshi took them to japan 
They all changed when they became the hands. The 45 degrees now come at 90 degrees. So all the techniques you do are at 90 degrees. Why? No answer came the stern reply. The fact of the matter is the 45 degrees are because as the technique comes at you, the best position to be in is deflect and be at 45 degrees where you can hit the guy with every, both knees, both elbows, stamping kicks, whatever. But if you move out to 90 degrees, you can't do that. You can't touch him. You can at best do something stupid like a racket because all your other side has moved too far away from the fight. So what people don't do is take it far enough. And here's the deal. I don't stamp my name on these things. I, I Yes, I'm proud to have been a pioneer in it, but I've given this information out freely to the whole, I mean, you should ask me how many Japanese sets you bought my videos. You'd be surprised. They often go to Japan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not a word of them until I see them on, the, on YouTube. <laughs> oh, suddenly, after many years, they're going to teach you the truth. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> the rules of combat are what make the difference between living and dying. And don't forget that these have been tested uh, i mean i was for 12 years teaching special forces uh, the the, uh, the anti-terrorist groups the got the men in black in fact the ones that we couldn't take photos of because it was too dangerous um and uh, also the trainers to the police uh, interestingly when i first started doing it the uh, police academy brought in the uh, Krav Maga instructors, you know, big reputation, you know, yeah. and they gave them the same situations to deal with as they gave me to deal with. And after an afternoon of that, they said goodbye to Krav Maga and they rewrote the handbook, the training handbook eventually to include our techniques. And I'm proud of that. Why? Because I've got letters that say these saved my life. Mm -hmm. I know it works. It's not like I dream it up in the dojo. Uh, well, not that I would ever do that. But sometimes we do something that I think is good at the time, and then I think, no, it's not that. It's, it would it would fall down here or if that happens. So, so then I'll revise it, and I'll go back, and I'll do it again. But a lot of the techniques, it, for example, one of the very first ones that I worked on was techie. Techie Showdown, because I just love the sheer brutality of it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing nice in it. Although yeah. I was taken to task by one guy that said, it's just a, it's a partner um, uh, a flow drill and you're not supposed to hurt anyone. And we can't, we don't want you to do this in our dojo because it's too violent. And I'm thinking, ah, well, <laughs> what do I do now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the thing is, the techniques that I was teaching there, with a little bit of tweaking, I'm still teaching now. And I've even taught them to officers to retain their, their firearms when they're, I mean, at the time, 25% of officers shot on duty were shot with their own weapons. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any weapon retention skills. So I adapted some of the techniques from techie into weapon retention training, and we're still using it today. But others, I've, I've changed a little bit because as time goes on, you learn more. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think if you're still doing the same thing now that you were doing 20 years ago, you've got to have a good reason for it. Lots of other things you should be doing better. Yeah. So have, that have does bring up some. I talk a lot. I was going to say, it shuts Bob up because he normally it, talks It does, because so. it's normally me that never shuts. <laughs> <laughs> but you do bring up a point there uh, with you talking about techie and, and modifying those techniques for weapon retention skills, which almost certainly wouldn't have been the original intention. Ah, you're wrong. Am I? Oh, yeah. Good. In that case, carry it, it on. Was, it was one of the favourite catters of uh, the person, uh, uh, no, I've, I've forgotten, Matsumura. Was it Matsumura? Anyway, he was the chief of the bodyguard squad teaching the various kings in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And on that squad, uh, you also had both of Asa uh, Kanaz uh, Fulikoshi's teachers, Azato mm -hmm. and Itosa. And why do you think that was such a good kata for them 
if it wasn't against weapons, because nobody attacking the king would say, oh, I'll put my sword down and I'll come in there empty handed. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was absolutely made for weapons. And a lot of people don't understand that the early catters were often practiced with weapons. For example, the hair, the steel hairpins that were in, in the, the top knot, mm -hmm. they often used that in practicing the catter because it was a weapon. Only a fool would undertake empty hand fighting in the face of people with weapons. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I'm, I didn't mean to be abrupt, but I mean- No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> it, it, it's certainly a, a, the reason for it being on a line instead of going off on the MBCM like all the others is because on that line, you're there and right behind you is the principal. In, mm -hmm. in Maximovsky, it was the king. And you couldn't go off that line to fight the others because as soon as you did that, somebody just killed the king. Mm -hmm. So you had to stay on that little tiny straight line Emerson and you could not apply arm locks. You could not apply little throws. Mm -hmm. You could not do any of that. You had to use the most violent techniques you could because you were supposed to kill them before they got to kill the king. Mm -hmm. Now, why would Matsumura put such emphasis on that kata if he didn't think it was going to be any good? He wouldn't. At least that's no. my thing. No, 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 no. I'm fine with that. But it, it's sort of like the modern take on unarmed combat in military situations. It's very much a last resort. These people aren't training for hand to hand. That's a very small part of what they do because they're weapons based. Yes, but you have to think of one other thing. Mm -hmm. Let's say you were going into the, 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 the main hall of uh, uh, um, uh, a Japanese lord, mm -hmm. um, Hatamoto or Daimyo or whatever. First thing you have to do is leave your weapons at the door. Mm -hmm. You can't get in with weapons. So don't you think it might be a good idea for his bodyguard to have skills that would work against weapons and no weapons? Mm -hmm. Because the likelihood is if anyone sneaks a weapon in, indeed, there wouldn't be many. The yeah. rest would be unarmed and, and he'd be in a situation where, well, what are you going to do? Sorry, go back and get a sword and then we'll start again. No, you deal with what you've got. And it was the customer at the time that, that you probably wouldn't let anybody in with the two swords at the most you'd have the wakizashi the short sword and that would be a trusted retainer but even people that you knew and trusted had to leave their swords at the entrance and come in unarmed mm -hmm. i mean that's actually the same in britain in the, in the feudal period because you weren't allowed into the hall of the of the of the local king wearing weapons you had to leave them outside because nobody trusted you no. so yes there was a need for unarmed uh, defense mm -hmm. not on the battlefield um, although, to be fair, Kumiuchi, with the origins of uh, the grappling in, in uh, Japan, were born from battlefield when the warriors were knocked down and you had to get your little knife and push it into between into the soft spots of the armor. Mm -hmm. So that, you had to, get, you know, there was grappling even then on the on the on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But that was just sheer bad luck because, you know, you wanted to kill them with the weapon. It's cleaner, yeah. quicker, easier. It's sort of the last resort, isn't it, in that situation? But, of course, in a battlefield situation, there are so many variables and so many unknowns. The chances of standing on your feet and people milling about and poor situations that, yeah. Well, you see, I say, well, that, isn't that exactly the same in a bar? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, the only reason you don't have an M14, M15 or whatever it is with you in the bar, well, in America, you will. You will but, <laughs> um, I'm glad I don't live there now. Oh, dear. Anyway, but yes, I mean, but I think also there's the problem of your self-defense has to be uh, workable, yes, effective, yes, but it has to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So, you, it, uh, I ju mind you, in England just this week, I heard, a, I read the case of a, um, as a Sikh that was attacked by four men with knives and he had a knife he killed three of them mm -hmm. and he was let off no charge at all yeah uh, good for him mm. yeah i don't know why did you hear that i haven't actually heard that one no I'm, yeah it's yeah, in the it's sunday times news at the moment because it's just too depressing yeah yeah i mean 
I think England's a scary place now. Uh, uh, knives cause bloody awful injuries. Mm. I know guns do too, but, you know, mm. you, I think you'd probably... I, up close, I'd rather you pointed a pistol at me than waved a big long knife at me because I've seen the damage that that can do, you know, and I know how hard it is. I spent many years just refusing to teach knife defence because it was always, you know, kick, the, kick it out of his hand in a spinning back <laughs> kick and the other kick <laughs> and clout him in the head, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Not in my dreams. <laughs> no, no, Not no. in my little legs. <laughs> But you have to have effective defence because I had to teach those things to the cops and to the, uh, I mean, in fact, I had guys that were carved up with knives in the street or in people's houses when they went to, uh, um, I suppose there were disputes between husband and wife, really. The funny thing is, once you got there to arrest the bloke, the wife would often be the one that would stab you. Because mm -hmm. suddenly she wants to protect the husband that was just beating the shit out of her a few minutes before. Yeah. Well, that's life. But, you, you know, they I've seen the wounds that they've had. But then they explained that the techniques that I was teaching them in the academy actually did save them because they might have got stabbed or cut once. But that was it. They weren't repeatedly stabbed and they obviously they weren't killed. But nothing's certain. You just got to give it your best shot. Mm. But. Yeah. It can't be rocket science to see that if you don't replicate in your training the violence and the movement of what actually happens, how the hell are you really preparing your students for what is going to happen? Yeah. Unless yeah. you suddenly issue an edict that says everybody, every attacker has got to step back six foot away, <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> safe and get into a low stance and then charge in and punch you once and hold it there until you've had a chance to beat the crap out of them. Well, you see, perhaps the Japanese were ahead of the game. They saw this corona thing coming and the social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're ready. The rest of us are struggling and they're ready. Well, the Japanese are the worst. They were the worst. The younger ones now are stealing the techniques left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. The older, I mean... I mean, I taught in Kanazawa's dojo in China at least three times. And uh, he had all his seventh dans and eighth dans lined up there for me to teach. And they didn't know anything. Honestly, they could do basics and they could do Ippon Kumite and they could do the, uh, the, the special Ippon Kumite that Kanazawa invented by numbers and all that sort of thing. They couldn't fight. They could do they could do competition fighting, but you jump on them, grab them by the throat, and smack them onto the ground. And oh shit, no, we don't do that. Well, you should. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing was because I was very respectful in those days, I would never go up to my seniors, these old Japanese guys, and say, "But that's not right." I would go to the people next to them, and I'd teach the guy next to him, and I'd ask this. The first one was really fucking it up. What do you think? Yeah, that's not. Yeah. I, yeah, and it, okay, so I left him his face. I didn't take face away from the senior. I taught the guy next to him. Yeah. But honestly, Kanazar himself lost a lot of members from his dojo because they came to join Gisaki Kai. And there was no fault but his because uh, the guy that was uh, uh, Andy, uh, who was. Uh, secretary for the for his dojo and a, a fifth dan or something at the time kept saying to sensei why don't you teach what vince teaches he said oh one day maybe well it's too old now and he's, like, he's dead now but then when he did start to teach them he still didn't do he still did things like hikate mm -hmm. because i go back to this if you train incorrectly the longer you train incorrectly, the more difficult it is to get rid of those bad habits. Yeah. And, and there's no, it just is, it's, that's the way it is. And, you know, Asano was a bit different in as much as he, he, well, he was an animal, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, and, and he didn't like anybody, uh, <laughs> Japanese or anyone. He was polite to his uncle, Kanazawa, but, um, but not to many <laughs> other people, except for those who are at university with him, like uh, Nagai and people like that. Didn't like Kato at all, neither did I, but there we are.
Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. What, but to, just to return for a moment to what can people do if they are into reverse engineering. First thing I'm going to say is buy my books or my videos or simply go and look at all the free examples that are out there. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah. And if you have a, if they have a question, ask me. I, I, I say all the time. I mean, in fact, I've just sent the newsletters out today. You'll have got one, I imagine, yeah. or it'll be on its way to you. And it says, if you have any questions, ask. Because I, I do not, I'm not selling the Vince Morris karate. I'm not stamping everything with my name on it. I would have loved some of the instances when I see blatant theft or plagiarism of people coming back with my techniques, even to the extent of copying my photos exactly and then posting their photos doing the same exact to the millimeter techniques. But I've given up worrying about that long ago. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the way of the world. If they haven't got the good manners to say thank you or to just give a nod in the right direction, because I don't own them. It's about martial arts. It's about karate. And when somebody can, if, if I see a technique that somebody does and it's really good, I'll say, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I say, you know, I mean, why wouldn't I? I'm a martial artist, not, 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 not a, a collector of technique. Yeah. Well, you, you, you spoke about the rules of combat, Vince. It's not something you've made up, is it? You know, they're, they're, they're historical combative principles, you know. So although you've made a definitive list. Yeah, you know, I, I put them into lists and I explain how they are relevant. But you see, here's the thing. People have been kind enough to say it's like a modern Sun Tzu's art of war. But if, have you read Sun Tzu's art of war? How good is that for helping your technique? It gives you sort of philosophical mm -hmm. ideas, mm -hmm. but then you try and translate that into somebody trying to grab you from behind. Well, mm, to, to gain territory in the East, you must give territory in the <laughs> bollocks. You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can, you know, it's head scratching time. Yeah. Um, I, so I rewrote them and I added more because don't forget, I trained military tactics. I, tr I, I studied so many situational um, occurrences and um, reports from the police. And I was, I'm still in the loop, by the way, now. I mean, I'm still getting stuff more or less every day from my colleagues back in the law enforcement training because I'm still a member of the American law enforcement trainers. And I just take, I, I don't take it and believe it. I take it and test it. Yeah. And then... If it works over a period, I don't say, I dreamt this up. Just give it you. This is a rule. Think about it. Can you see? And like I say on seminars, don't believe what I say. Don't, because I'm a liar. I'll tell you anything to get you 50 pence, wherever they're getting like. <laughs> how, long, how long ago was that? <laughs> but don't believe what I say. Watch what I do. And I say to them, You've seen me say that, and, and of course, on seminars, I always ask for the biggest people to come out, but they bloody don't. Well, they once, maybe. But I always say, if I bring somebody out, I don't tell them what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I always, only say, it's, I will not hurt you more than a little bit. But, yeah. Well, it's everything's. I mean, you got you can't smack someone even lightly in the head without it being a bit of a, a wake up. But I never take advantage, and I say to them, guys, look, I'm going to hit him here, and then I make him stand like that, and I tell the rest of the room, this is what's going to happen. And so I hit him the bike. To do. Did I tell you that? Yes. Did I tell him? No. The fact of the matter is. The results are the proof of the training. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Yeah. If you train so hard to do something, do something and it doesn't work, it doesn't move on. It's not for you. Do something else. Mm -hmm. Not every technique fits everybody. But most of the reason why techniques don't work is because people don't do them right. Sometimes in seminars, I'm jumping up and down saying, that's not what I told you to do. <laughs> not what I showed you to do. Why are you doing that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. 
I was on one of those seminars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody's on one of those seminars. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's not an uncommon thing, is it, is that people come with already with their pictures in their head and what they're trying to do <laughs> is apply what they think to what you've said rather than listening to the words and doing what you told them to do. Well, the worst culprits, and I'm sure you've run into them, are those that start teaching their own methods over oh, in the corner of the dojo. Yes. Oh, God. I, I just oh. call them out and I say, if you want to teach what you're going to teach, yeah. how much are you going to charge? We'll all come to you next week. Right now, you're in my fucking dojo and you'll de- do what I say or you'll go. Yeah. And I just show yeah. them the door. But they, but it's so, it's so, I didn't ask them to come to the dojo to show me what they mm. do. No. I wanted them to try and do what I do and see if it's any good. If they don't like it, then they could come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I'd rather do this and I'd rather do that. What you That happens sometimes. I say, yeah, it's perfectly fine. You can make that work. Go with it. Mm-hmm. But here's the big problem between teaching self-defense and teaching karate to groups. Everybody that steps into the dojo is training for themselves. None of them are training for someone half their size and weight or with a bad leg or that's 75 years old. They're all training to do what they can do. And they're normally within the range of from about 18 to 35, 40 ish. That's fine. But if you take what you get from that and think that's your self-defense basis, it's wrong. Because what you can do, somebody different sex, half your size, half your height, half your weight, cannot do. So you have got to learn that self-defense is different from basic karate. It's as Mm. simple as that. There's an overlap, but it's different. I mean, if I'm teaching, I mean, I get MMA fighters, Kyokushinkai fighters, I get all kinds come in. And, uh, you know, I I let them grab me, they can do what they like. And quite often, well, look, I'm only small. I mean, I don't perhaps look it, but I am. I mean, I'm only five foot ten, and I'm most of the people I try and pick out are at least three or four inches bigger than me. Um, and then people say, "But you're built really big." I wasn't always like that. I had to work to get like that. I had to eat a lot of dojo um, treats after training and whatever. You can't get like that, but. A serious point you have got to research and you've got to see you've got to ask people i mean i talk to eva a lot because luckily she's a bloody good martial artist and she kicks far better than i ever can and she'll say to me do you think i can do that technique and so we'll try it and often it won't work with eva so we'll have to modify it somehow so that women who have only got half my body weight can make the techniques work Mm-hmm. Luckily, there are techniques that work for anybody, any size, because you're using major body mechanics, moving out of the line of the attack, unbalancing and coming in from this 45 degree angle where it's most unlikely you'll be hit from. You can't be hit from there. And if the techniques are violent enough, it, I mean, a girl can stamp on the outside of your knee just as well as a man can. Yeah. And, and, you know, and they can then, if they like, I mean, like Eva can kick me in the bloody head or the arse anytime she likes. I hate her for it. But, <laughs> women, you know, k- k- karate techniques are brilliant, but you can't do it unless you understand move. No fights are done with sticky feet. You have to move. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't move, they'll move you because they'll just plow in and move you. Yeah. The trick is to be where they're not. You're not where they are, but they can't counter you. Um, yeah, well, covered that. Right, next. <laughs> <laughs> I've got what the list of questions was, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, you are obviously a very good uh, karate competitor in the old days as well as... I was, yeah, I love fighting, but I would never fight my own teammates. All oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah, I'd only fight in the teams, and obviously I'd do the kata, but I would never fight individuals if I was fighting my own teammates. 
I didn't want to hurt them. I didn't want them to hurt me either, but I didn't want to. I, I, a lot of people say, well, that's the wrong attitude. It was my attitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on the British team four or five years. We won it two or twice, three times, came second once or twice. I, was, I won medals in Qatar. And that's a story in itself. The last time I did, I, I, I worked for six, well, no, probably six weeks on Nijushiho, uh, Nijushiho Kata. And it's got those lovely sidekicks in it, which were never there in the first place. However, the night before the Saturday Championships, Asano pulled me out and beat the crap out of me, mawashied my thigh so hard that the bruise spread from my backside down to my ankle and I couldn't move my leg. So how am I going to do side kicks in that? Mm -hmm. I couldn't. So I got there and they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, oh, I don't know. Pick another one. Uh, Hungets. I did Hungets. Kanazawa <laughs> gave me the best marks of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just can't write that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that just tells you the type of training we had with uh, – uh, Asano, because yeah. you would think, I mean, we'd won the title the year before. You'd think he'd want us to retain the title. And I think we had a, a hundred teams. And it, we started at just about nine o'clock in the morning. And we finished just after midnight. And on that occasion, the local Queen's Hospital said at, at lunchtime, we're not going to send you any more ambulances. You've had 12 so far. <laughs> anymore but his okay. attitude was he pulled me out to do the kumite and it was not important to him what was happening tomorrow what was happening right now while i was in front of him was what was important so he beat the crap out of me but mm -hmm. that was a big lesson you know i mean it taught me that sometimes you've got to get things in perspective and we didn't win that year either as i recall we, we came second um so he might have forsaken a winning place, you know, we, who knows? But his attitude was do what you have to do now. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about tomorrow. That's another, and that's typical Japanese samurai spirit. That fits right in with his background. I can appreciate that, but I've still got the picture. And one day I'll post it up on the web so you can have a look <laughs> at my backside. When I, <laughs> well, there's something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, isn't it? <laughs> Try all these things a little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was a piece of work. Oh, dear so did you eventually sort of like give up competition and just trans uh, transfer mainly into the what is now called applied karate? But we may come back to that in a minute. <laughs> well, it's sort of. I was. No, you see, here's the thing. When when Asano did the first all the basic Shotokan kata, filmed them all. He then asked me and Paul me to do all the bunkai because mm -hmm. he, he didn't know what a bunkai was. Well, I mean, he probably could work out Agayuki, Gakazuki, but, you know, so he asked us to look at the bunkai. But I was already right, right in those early days thinking, well, you know, I've been reading all these books since I was 10 or 11 years old. I used to get these old books on ancient Japanese karate and look at the hand positions and the finger positions and think, well, what's that for then? And then obviously 15 years later or whatever, I'm training with the Japanese, and I'm, but I don't see any of those. And none of them would answer my questions because Asano just used to hit me on the head. I'd ask him questions, he hit me on the head, more training making. Yeah, yeah well, that's good. Um, <laughs> No answer. So I was doing my own research at the time and I would got into Kyushu Jitsu. I had started the International Institute for Kyushu Jitsu Research because I don't like bullshit. And I was watching all these people like George, what's his name? Uh, Dillman. George Dillman yeah. uh, doing his magic. And so we brought him over. We went up to Scotland. We had a, a half of a ruined farmhouse in near Stirling. And myself and Dave Hook and Aidan and a, about six or seven other UK instructors paid for him to come over and we wanted to know what he'd got and what he could do. So that was my first introduction to him. Well, I must say I was not very impressed with him as a person uh, and I was not very impressed with his techniques because 
he had us all lined up in the dojo, walking along, slapping into the jaw and doing this, that, and the other. But like, nobody fell over. <laughs> and I remember Dave Hook said in his earshot as he was coming down the line, he said, does that to me again? I'm going to fucking drop him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't. But the thing is, uh, I give him some credibility because he opened my eyes to the fact that Chinese medicine could be useful in the martial arts. So I tended to look at it and then I'd think, oh, hmm, what's all this about chi and ki? Because I don't believe in mysterious forces. If you can't see it, taste it, touch it, hear it or analyze it, it's not there. And so I started my research and I went way back into the origins of acupuncture and I went way back into the tests and I found out, for example, that in the Nixon period, when the Americans sent a team to research the uh, 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 Chinese acupuncture medicine at that time, and they came back all enthused by it, what they hadn't known and didn't find out until years later, that all the participants had been given anesthetic or opioids before the Americans were let in to see what how they could be operated on without anything except uh, acupuncture. Uh -huh. It's all lies. And even uh, Chairman Mao got rid of it at one stage because it was bullshit. But money talks. Mm. Money talks. That's all it is. And then you've, I mean, you couldn't put George Dillman on the stage next to one of these fake American preachers in a white suit and tell the difference. Mm -hmm. They all tap you on the head and people fall over. Garen Brown is the one to read on stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it came to the, the, the end of, the, of this research into uh, Q show points based on the acupuncture theory. But then I went into looking at studying the human body, anatomy, physiology, and the nervous yeah. system of the human body. And then it became <laughs> obvious that there were not all that many acupuncture points that were much good for fighting. And the ones that were, were over nerve nexuses or nerve complexes or where a nerve ran close over a bone. Yep. So you could make it the strike to it really work. And in the end, I just decided Gilman was just one of the, you know, P.T. Barnum snake oil peddlers and you can always tell his people because they all wear black jackets and the, the more badges and patches you've got, the better you are. You know, you can't do it without every square inch covered in a badge. But, and then I'm so ashamed of Wally Jay's son. Wally Jay I like because I had him over in England as well. He was over here. And uh, I really had a lot of time for him. But then when he died, his son, Okay, is now T you've probably seen that famous uh, clip on YouTube of the guy standing there and this guy going, you know, it's, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, it's not going to work. Well, that's uh, Leon Jay's son. <clears throat> when I knew him, he was a chef in England. Ooh. And suddenly he's a master. <laughs> there you go. What can I say? Master in bullshit. <laughs> not, I, since the 1970s, Nine, late 1970s, I had a little saying that I'd take anywhere to people that were doing all this. I said, okay, do it to me. Yeah. Simple as that, do it to me. I've never been knocked down by any of them. And, and you know, I mean, I used to do this thing of having, I'd, I'd say, who's the biggest guy? Who's the best puncher in the dojo? And they'd say, oh, well, uh, uh, he is, all right, come on. So I'd say, just punch me as hard as you can, not in the face because anyone's going to go down from that. Punch me in the body, wherever you like, and keep punching, you know, do what you can. And, of course, to start with, they thought I was not serious. But then I used to piss them off, and they would get <laughs> serious. Um, and uh, it, it was no, if after you've been hit by a Sarno and all those things, it's not a really, it's not that difficult. You know, you just learn to cope with that and, and keep a stone face. That's the other thing I learned from him. You don't show anything on your face. You don't show tension. You don't show fear. You don't show anger. You just look at people with dead eyes and you just walk towards them. And that's kind of it's quite off-putting. 
That's what Eva does to me when I've pissed her off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, my wife can do that as well. Yeah, it pays to know your place, doesn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I tend to wander off on back alleys with all these conversations because there's so yeah. much I could talk about. Yeah, mm. So much I wouldn't dare talk about. Of what we've talked about. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, once you've seen Kanazawa sitting on a table, no, standing on a table in a beer keller, wearing Cuban high heel boots and a funny hat, dancing to German umpa bands, you've really <laughs> seen it all. Yeah. <laughs> well, people tend to forget, don't they, when it comes to the karate masters and the big names. They're just people like everybody else. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's not the entirety of their world. They're real people. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like when everyone starts talking about perfection of character, and karate is especially good for that. You think it's just bollocks? There's so many dickheads who do karate out there. Where's the perfection? Yeah, but of character? they're perfect dickheads, Andy. We've discussed this before. Yeah, yeah. Perfection of character and good character are two different things. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. When I was uh, chairman of the Martial Arts Commission, we used to have a guy come up. I won't tell you. Let's call him. Let's call him Johnson because I don't want to embarrass him. But at every meeting, he would talk and talk and talk until he forgot what he was talking about. And everyone was going, oh. Anyway, I nicknamed him Zen Johnson. And he came up to me after one session. He said, oh, I really appreciate that. You know, you're calling me Zen. Um, mean, and he thought it meant he was cutting straight through to the point. And I had to explain it was no, because I thought he'd found emptiness and it was between both of his ears. <laughs> <laughs> but then again you see then i was i was the chairman of the ekgb was it i don't know anyways it's british karate english karate body yeah. and when they made me chairman the first thing i did was everyone's got to bring their gi and before we start talking we spend an hour training with each other and that used to sort out people <laughs> because if they were being idiots you'd just spar with them for half an hour and then they'd be quite quiet during the proceedings <laughs> <laughs> but that, as soon as i left the position of chairman of course i don't know it might have been fico i can't remember now but then it was you know they reverted to uh, no no we just go there and eat sandwiches and talk mm -hmm. <laughs> <sighs> that sounds like my sort of gig <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, man, I had some bad times. I had to go to Paris once to Pierre Coubertin Stadium and stop the KUGB team from competing. I was nobody's friend in the KUGB after that mm -hmm. because yeah. the EKGB team was the official representative, but they both turned up. Oh, then I had to go to Madrid to sort out that one of Tiki's team's members got shot by the cops, and I had to go there with a barrister and sort that out. <laughs> Oh, a lot, lots and lots of things happen, believe me. Mm -hmm. If I had time, I'd write a book, but can't release it while I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pays to have it there, filed away, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, and, and, I was going to say, so actually, you, you're, not, you're not afraid to tell it like it is, Vince, you know, so that's one thing. When I, when I first attended one of your seminars, it was a breath, breath of fresh air, do you know what I mean? Having somebody just like, blatantly dismissing all the myths and, and, and telling it like it is. Has it got you in trouble over the years? <laughs> do, you, do you even care? <laughs> of course it has, yes. Because people say, oh, he's arrogant, he's big-headed. I probably am, but that's not why I do it. It's because I think I was taught bullshit for years, but not by Asano, because he never said anything. So mm -hmm. it's not that he was telling me that. He did what he knew, and he came to us as a fighter, you know, twice all, uh, all Japan, you know, students champion from Takushoki. He was there to make sure we had good, strong fighting. No, mm -hmm. no arguments with that. But there comes a time where that's got to be done with and you move on. And that's the problem that there's been in all the dojos now. There's never anywhere to move on to. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's why there are never any people over about 50 training very often in dojos because they can't do it anymore. Bad backs, metal knees, bad joints, all these problems get in the way so they can't do it. Whereas if they trained in what you want to call applied karate, of course they can do it. Yeah. But to get back to the point, I mean, I most of the jack, I've got a newspaper article. I don't even know who wrote it, um, but that how how much I'd upset the Japanese by spoiling the the magic, because I I just go and say, all right, 
it doesn't work. Why are you doing it? And, oh, yeah. I can understand why I upset people. I, I really can, because the truth is I don't suffer fools gladly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're in the dojo with me and I tell you something and then you want to argue with me, I'll be nice. But if you still want to argue with me, no, I won't be nice anymore. I've not come there to argue with people. If you want to argue, well, there's a time and place for that. Uh -huh. But my answer is, well, let's do it. Because I just think that, you know, a picture paints a thousand words and a thump in the eye tells you a lot about how effective your defense is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, but I have never, ever deliberately shown up any of my ukis. I've never deliberately hurt anybody in the dojo. But what I have done is say, look, we're here together now. You're on my tatami. We're going to be truthful with each other. And that's why I say, look, I'm not going to teach you fancy techniques. I know some. I know some brilliant techniques, you know, I mean, uh, for fun. But if we're talking about real karate, I want you to say, crikey, what happened there then? Because the other thing I teach is, how many times has the other guy hit me after we start this? Oh, I let him throw the first punch. The answer is, I never get hit. Nobody in Kisaki gets hit if you do it properly because it's all over and finished within a second or two. Mm -hmm. And there's never a chance for them to reload and punch with the other hand, for example, unless I set it up like that. If I say, oh, come on, swing with both hands right from the start, just go for it. But normally it doesn't happen that way because as soon as one punch comes, that's it. Yeah. And, and, and one kick comes, that's it. That's what we try to learn ourselves through experience. And often we get hit when we're starting to do it. Yeah. But it always comes down to the basics that we spoke about earlier. Don't be in that spot. Mm -hmm. You have to move. So, yeah, I appreciate you saying what you said because often I don't know whether people like it or not, but it's the way I am. Eva says to me sometimes, she says, you can't say that. You can't <laughs> say he's a moron or something, you know. But I can, and I can say it in a number of languages now. <laughs> no, I must say, yeah, for me, it was it was a breath of fresh air. It was it was great. It was great for someone to be so honest and down to earth, you know, with with, uh, with what they were teaching, what they were saying. So yeah, but the, not, the other thing yeah. is, people have to realise I'm old now, but I haven't stopped learning. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I still I, I've got techniques that I only figured out six months ago, and some of the best techniques I know now. For example, there's two or three catters where you go round with the arms like this and you come down like this. Mm -hmm. I had no bloody idea for 30 years what that meant. Now I know what they mean. And for men, women, or even kids, they are brilliant techniques to escape from grabs and to put people onto the ground. Now, I only figured that out within the last six to nine months. And there are other aspects like that, which just keeps me thrilled because I'm delighted by it. I think, wow, come on, this is something, you know. Yeah. Please hit me so I can try this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the real frustration at the moment, isn't it? Is not being able to get into a room with somebody and do that. Yeah, but, you know, I, I have to admire people that can keep going because I've found it hard. Uh, this last month has been dreadful, but even before that, I was getting sick and tired of just training on my own or we either and I would do our training and we'd finish it by nine, nine thirty in the morning. But about middle of the afternoon, it's like we never did it at all. It's, mm -hmm. You know, what, what happened to that? Mm -hmm. It's not the same. And I, of course, I like to have challenges. I like to have people that push me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need that. You need that a good uki. You need a good uki. Yeah. Someone yeah. that really goes for you but is still going to understand that you might not be uh, perfectly competent at this technique yet so they're not going to break your nose for you, you might dink it a bit but but you know what i mean yes. and yeah. at the moment i'm devising my own training schedule i use the um, um 
uh, a, a timer, um, which is, uh, I just got it off the, off the, uh, uh, off the web. It's, uh, it gives you interval training, high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. You can set the time, like at the moment, it's, uh, we can start off with 12 segments of one minute each with a 15 second rest between. And each of the 12 segments you fill up with things like, you know, push ups as fast as you can for a minute, squat jumps for a minute, uh, kick bagyuki gagazuki for a minute, jumping up and down on, on benches for a minute, push ups, sit ups, and all, all those kinds of things. And, and after a set of those, and then we, I've got a battle rope as well, which is really quite good to finish oh, with. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of that, you know, you warmed up nicely. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing is the same as standing in front of somebody that's going to smack you on. No. 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 And, uh, and also, you know, other people get good ideas too. It's, I'm, not, I'm not the only person that can think these up. I, I know that. And, and I often look and I think, oh, I like that. But you see, some of the things I see which I think I'd like to do are because I used to be a judoka. And so a lot of the things are taking people to the ground. But that's all well and good. And I'd love to do it for fun. But in reality, I never want to be on the ground. Even mm -hmm. if it's to bring somebody else down, I don't want to be on the ground. I've seen what happens too often to people that have their heads kicked in. And there are some horrible, horribly violent people out there. They think nothing of stamping on your face, you know. Can, mm -hmm. I, I, so I'm not going to teach my students to go. I mean, obviously in Kisaki Kai, we teach them how to get up if yeah. you're not yeah. down. And I do teach some of the throws that bring you down onto one knee as you throw or something like that. But I'm not going to do the sacrifice, the Sotemi Waza throws that put you down on your back because it's just too dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... There's an, I mean, an, a, a, there's such a lot of interesting stuff out there. And the bugbear I have at the moment is the way the American police have banned the bilateral choke. The, um, you're not allowed to use that anymore in America, which is the one technique that would solve 90% of all that problem of people fighting around on the ground, having 10 cops on top of them. Because it, it's illegal now. And when I used to be there, it wasn't. We could teach it. And it was taught in safety. We never had any injuries, never had any deaths, never had any problems with it. Rory Miller said the same thing. He said when he was at the prison, they took away the, the choke as a technique they were allowed to use because it was deemed lethal force. He yeah. said more people got injured afterwards. You end up having to, to actually batter half of them to subdue them. Well, you're absolutely right. Um. I mean, but the problem, here's the, one of the problems. I mean, I was out with the, I used to go out on uh, 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 violent criminals arrest in uh, Los Angeles with the cops at one time. And the, I, I, we talk about the big problem in policing. And they'd say to me, the big problem is that the upper echelon, the captains and above, never go out on the streets and the only weapon they can use is a pencil. And so they make all these bloody laws and, and, and they, for officer safety and for, uh, you know, for prisoner safety. And, for, and every time they do it, they never put the cop first. So what's happened is that the, the actual expertise of, of uh, uh, arrest and control has almost vanished in America in preference for tasers, asps and pepper spray. Mm. And none of those work 100% of the time. And, you know, for example, when I was with the police, we used to have a hut outside that we'd fill with OC spray. And you couldn't finish the course until you'd been inside that building and stayed there for a minute and before you could come out. And we had a bus outside, which we put them in and we go in and spray them and see if the guys could come out and still fight. And there were one or two people, in fact, on my video cop combat, <coughs> dates way back 20 years now, there's examples of the guy sitting in the bus there being sprayed from canisters of spray and just getting up and attacking the officers because it doesn't work all the time. And if you've got 
all that in your hand, you're not likely to suddenly drop it to try and pull out your pistol because you're fixated in doing what you're doing. Yeah. And the actual fact of the matter is reliance on weapons has been such a bad thing. Here's another little thing that <laughs> you, the cops can't win because when the tasers first came out, they were very effective. Now they only work in oh, probably 65, 70% of the time. Why? I'll tell you why, because the manufacturers of the tasers found that the original ones used to fire the spikes, okay, and the spikes were often would miss because they were at the wrong angle. But even when they hit, there was only a certain amount of voltage that was going through. But in the, those days, it was a higher amount of voltage than it was than it is now. So it would invariably knock people over. But when they came to supply them to the cops, they lowered the voltage of the tasers so that it was for safety, but it doesn't knock them down so often. That's why you'll see them having to tase people more than once. And often some people are not, not, not been affected by it at all mm -hmm. because they've changed the spread of the, the darts and they've lowered the power of the, of the voltage. Uh, well, it's daft. I mean, you give them a technique that, that was useful, and then they make it, it you know, 25 percent uh, useless. So I, and the, and they won't spend money on training. Um, hand to hand training is almost non-existent now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've heard from people that write to me from the UK as well, UK cops serving officers, um, that, that uh, saying exactly the same thing. I think they said they get less than a day's hand-to-hand -hand training a year. Well, that includes with uh, side handle batons and all that. So one day, it's less than a day a year, I think. In the uh, Let's Training Manual, I put a chapter on retention of technique. How many days you have to train in a technique for it to actually be retained by you? And what happens if you don't train it again within certain periods of time? And, of course, if you do it once in academy and then not, nothing again ever, then by the end of that year, probably 60 to 70 percent of that skill has gone. Yeah. And you're just using bad techniques to, to, to do it, which will go against you one of these days. But that used to be when I mean, I used to be in quite demand. I used to go to different police academies, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, whatever. And people would turn up in their dozens, instructors, to see these things and to do these things. But in the last few years that I was there, you couldn't, be, you couldn't go anywhere because no department had the money for it. And the cops wouldn't pay for it themselves and they wouldn't be given paid time off for it. So it, it's a hide into nothing. So, you know... America really stuffed it up its own backside for training. <laughs> it's such a shame. Mm -hmm. So I was quite aware of the time, Vin. I don't know what we got about an hour, or are you happy to carry on? Um, so you don't want to take up too much of your time. So yeah, I mean, if, if you've got a decent question. <laughs> Anne's got a list. <laughs> no pressure there. Yeah. No. Okay, so let's just... Um, applied karate as such has grown... Yeah massively in the last few years i'd say i mean the internet makes it a lot easier than when we were all young and i mean in the picture above i think i read your stuff in magazines i've got i think maybe your first book or whatever then and i so i thought right this guy knows what it's about i'll invite him down whereas now you can look on the internet and find 10 billion things from 10 billion different people mm. what do you think about the applied crowd do you think they're i mean <laughs> Bob's raised his eyebrows because we've talked about this a lot and we sort of think that part of the applied karate movement now is very like the three K's in which they've gone into an alley and say, well, this is the, the answer. And all they're doing really is bunkai rather than thinking about things as a whole. But that's my point, <clears throat> that if you just do bunkai a, a la JKA karate, that means you're going to be stood right in front of the attacker and you're going to do your techniques and he's going to stand there and wait for you 
no matter how fast you are, he's going to stand there and wait for you to apply your technique. <clears throat> well, I suppose it could work if you were attacked by a demented Shotokan white belt or something. <laughs> But other than that, you're on a hide into nothing. I mean, and what happens when there's two or three, for example? You know, you're just going to stand there on the spot. No, there's nothing wrong. You've got to start somewhere. But what I object to these people, and it includes some of these Japanese instructors that are still looked upon as if they're gods. I mean, at one time, I was going to get my eyes fixed like that and call myself Matsumoto Morris, because I swear it would have brought me a lot more students. But... Everyone has to start somewhere, but people switch their brains off. Yeah. I mean, to me, you see somebody standing in long stance, six foot away, and he attacks the sensei, and the sensei does a bang, and it looks fantastic. You think, really? Now, how about if we did this as fast as you could do it? Okay. Oh, no, no. oh, not quite so tight. And then you say, well, now what if he's standing one foot away from you, like where most fights start? Well, it all goes to hell in a handcart then, because the sense he doesn't even get the hand up here before he's been hit. Why? Shouldn't have had his hands down. Kisaki Kai, we always say you've got to have your hands up here when somebody's in your space. There is no way on this planet you can have your hands down around your waist and I start to punch you and you're going to block my fist. Yeah, you will, but it'll be with your nose. It, people just have to apply brain power and ask hard questions. Mm -hmm. Sensei, can you show me how it would really work? Let me try and hit you. And if you can, you, know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be rude to them. You just have to say, can we try this full speed and power sensei from real distances? What do you mean real distances? Will you push him in the chest and say, this is a real distance, bang. And, oh, well, no, it's not, no, Senkutsudachi. Oh, all right. You have to ask hard questions. It's your money. You've paid for this and you've paid for the truth, not somebody soaking you for because you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. If you go in there with your stars in your eyes, you know, and people come out, they do the most complex hand techniques. Here's the thing. I've seen people teaching wrist grabs and I don't know, put them in. Like, and, you know, I did that when I, I remember I was in a I was in a band when I was 18 or something. And uh, we got in a fight with lots of the local yobs and got pulled off the stage and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I can clearly remember getting this bloke in a really nice Udi Garami. But because he was covered in sweat and blood and beer, his arm just twisted in my grip and he punched me straight in the face. I thought, ah, yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, you learn those lessons, <clears throat> which is why I never teach people to do those as a primary technique. Mm. <clears throat> because, you know, uh, shit happens and it will happen when the guy's sweaty and, 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 and situations aren't, aren't good. So, yeah, please think of what situation is this supposed to be a, a counter to? It's not good to say, okay, we'll just do bunkai. Yeah, but why are you doing that bunkai? What's yes. led yes. up to that bunkai? Yeah. Because if you haven't done that, if you're doing bunkai in isolation, just about anything will work. Because <clears throat> you're all playing, you, you've got a, little dance routine worked out here yeah yeah it's, it's coordinated choreography mm -hmm. but the question is here we go um you're going to punch me in the face how well no you choose oh really yeah where from over here i don't care you just hit me in the face which hand i don't care and if you can't do it in those conditions if you can't see by the way the person moves which hand is likely to be coming, or even do something like Kanku Dai flinch reflex defense, which covers the both left or right, then you're in shit because you just learned a dance routine, <clears throat> not a self defense routine. That's my point of view, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think you're probably preaching to the choir. Yeah, <laughs> I know that's, that's the just... problem, isn't it? That's yeah, but it's not, see, but here's the big problem. 
senses rely on the trust and respect of their students. It's built into the martial arts. Respect, you're always told about it. You have mm -hmm. to respect your sensei. But it seems to me so many senses don't respect their students. Yes. They take them for rights. They take them for idiots. Or they try to show a, how good they are at the expense of their students. Well, I hope I don't do that. I think we're in here together. And I might learn something from what's going to happen here today. Sometimes I get lazy. And, you know, sometimes I have been nearly clipped because... I've not bothered to move because it's, oh, I'm just showing, you know, I just, mm -hmm. but then I think, oh, come on, that's a wake up call. Let's do that <laughs> one again. <You> know? yeah. <laughs> but we all make mistakes. Monkeys fall out of trees, you know, it's, yeah. it's. Uh, uh, well, I but, think my, my biggest bugbear is if you're going to teach 3K sport karate, and if you say I'm teaching 3K sport karate, I've got no issues. If you're teaching 3K sport karate, but you're saying I'm teaching self-defense, that's not right. That's, I think that's my issue. If you say exactly what you're teaching, you're teaching what you're saying you're teaching, it's okay. But if you're saying you're teaching one thing, but teaching something else, that just annoys you. Know what, I understand that. I have no objections with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that people say, oh, well, look, Terry O'Neill, he used to do just shows you can. Look how good he is, but he was an animal. Yes. He used to fight all the time. He got his training in the bars and in the in, in the nightclubs. I look at my my good friend Aidan Trimble. He's got legs like oh I don't know, and he's a big guy. You yeah. know he can fight, yes. But here's the deal: I don't know. I'm, I, I shouldn't have chosen a name, but any of these instructors, that's fantastic. But how are they going to teach, let's say, a female flight attendant to 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 to, to deal with a drunken? Uh, Fujian rugby player that's just grabbed her by the throat. You know, that's this, or what What techniques should we use, Sensi? Well, it's a bit bloody late now. You should have done it already. Yeah. It's different. It's different. Mm -hmm. And I know people that have never done martial arts in their life, but I wouldn't like to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't because I'm not stupid and I'm old now. That's why I just play that card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, no, but seriously, martial arts is a big, big system. And mm -hmm. there are some parts of it, like Aikido, which I think is a joke, compared with Aikijutsu, which was not a joke. Um, original uh, Jiu-Jitsu, uh, brilliant. And judo, no, it's, it's fine if you're lucky to grab and throw somebody and plant them on their face and then walk away. But if it means you've got to go down to the ground with them, no, that's not a good one. Um, JKA karate, no. You've learned to fight from a distance that's, uh, you know, good for corona. Keeps six foot apart. Bars don't, fights in bars don't happen like that. And none of those teach you to deal with somebody that blindsides you from the back. Or somebody that just jumps on you. None of them teach you that. And none of them teach you what it's like to be a young woman, half your size, half your weight, you know, uh, or, or even an old pensioner that deserves to have good self-defense skills too. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong to teach your basic karate, whatever you call it, KKK or JKA or Kyokushinkai or uh what you know you can call it what system you like it, okinawan karate is a little better but unfortunately in okinawan karate they've mimicked the japanese style of karate now and they've instituted the long lower stances and the distances which is pathetic but it fits them into the system and the mm -hmm. schools of karate um yeah. you talk to my friend chuck merriman about that and he'll tell you in the old days if they saw people fighting with, uh, with closed fists, they'd laugh because it was a joke. The real fights would be between people that had open hands. And, you know, things were so different. And I don't care if, I mean, I spent years and years and years trying to be the best I could be at Shotokan. And I was never the best in the dojo. They're all, because I had little, I've got little legs. I know that sounds crazy. I could punch really well i had to because that was how i made up for it but i have got short thighs which means when i put my foot up in the air it only comes up to about here 
when people are Aiden and, 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 and Terry O'Neill, their legs are out there somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's right up in the air. Well, I can't alter nature, but I have to do the best I can with it. So, yeah, you can hone those skills and fit them into a self-defense routine as long as you've got the no the, the techniques so that you're not hit. Um, uh, you know, the first time a fist makes contact with you, all your plans go out of the window. Mm-hmm. So you have to have it built into your subconsciousness of how you're going to fight. And that means you have to learn and test it under pressure. Uh, and I'm all in favor of pressure training and not from stupid distances and not from prearranged karate style attacks because they, I, I'd, I'd say, I've never seen them. Never. Not in reality. They don't, people fights don't start that way. So why are you practicing so many months and years to do something to defend against what is not going to happen? Mm-hmm. We have the, in Kasakikai, rule of combat, train for what's most likely to happen first. Yeah. Then when well, you've done all that, you can train to defend against visiting Martians or whatever. But <laughs> first, train to defend against what's most likely to happen. Can we call a day on that? I think think Brian's got a very quick question to finish. Okay, go on then. I can do actually, Vince. I don't know. You mentioned it earlier, and I've got my guitar in the background. I've got a piano there, which is my my kid's piano. Now, you you, you obviously, you're a musician as well as a karate car. If if you could choose one or the other, (laughs) it's a hard one, isn't it? I'd be a musician. Really? Mm. Because... I can see that when I'm about 80 or 90, I might have to slow down with the karate, but I'm going to be <laughs> rocking and rolling until I die. <laughs> we did, uh, we, we had a brief chat about this, actually. You do a really good Elvis, don't you? So I've, I've listened to some of it. Yeah, and, uh... well, that was a problem for me when I was young because I, I know, uh, well, when I sing, my voice is in the same register as his, and I can impersonate him really well but I don't want to, but it's a mm. bugger because the songs that he sings are right in exactly my range. Yeah. But I tried it. I'm still, I mean, I'm working on one this morning, <laughs> um, a very old El- Elvis song. Um, but I just, I do it for the hell of it. I can do it. So why not? And mm. when I was younger, I was touring with a band and the manager wanted me to put on the jumpsuit, the white rhino stone, oh, rhinestone yeah. jumpsuit, yeah, yeah. do all that. And I wouldn't because... Even then, it's like oh, I didn't try to become a sauna. I didn't try there to become someone else, yeah. anyone else because yeah. I, I, why? I can't wear someone else's clothes. I have to do the best I can. Mm-hmm. And it's taken me all this time to f- have the time to devote to making my music. And that's why I put that CD out with about 20 odds, 22 songs on. And uh, mm-hmm. I love music. But I also think that musicians make very good martial artists because they have a sense of rhythm that's often not there for other people. It's just one of those things. And mm. most of the people I count as good, good karate care or good martial artists, they've got a background in music. They play the drums or the guitar or they do something. And uh, yeah, and I love music. Uh, it, when, I, when Asana used to beat the shit out of me, I used to go back to my flat in Nottingham and play the piano. And I, I just think to myself, he can't do that. <laughs> so there was something I could do that was better than anything he yeah. could. <laughs> yeah, as I was say, for, for me, it's, uh, there's, there's two things I do to relax. It's just like hit the bag or, or, or spa or whatever, and then play yeah. music. Yeah, so yeah. Just, music's a great... Uh, see, I really... don't see why you can't do them both. I mean, there's a time when you're not hitting the bags, you could be hitting the keys. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And, and, and to be honest, mm. I think being a musician illuminates some, your creative side because I couldn't be a painter. I'm not got that talent. I couldn't be a, 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 a dancer. I, I'm, oh, I say little legs. It's, it's not going to work. But I can hammer out a good boogie woogie. Yeah. And I, so do what you can do, but then be the best you can at it. And don't be ashamed of it. I mean, go for it. It's like in everything else. Just go for it. Which is a brilliant place to probably finish. I mean, enjoying it is probably the key. Yes. Yes. If you like hitting people, there's nothing better than martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I've got to say, it's that's been awesome talking to you. Um, I think well, I'm happy on. to do it again sometime if you want to want me to get into more detail about some of the things. That'd be uh, lovely. Yeah, really. Would yeah, like that. that was good. And it, it does me good to talk to other like-minded people. I think you know, or just bounce some ideas across. And mm. I'd like to hear some of the things that you're thinking about too, rather than it just being me all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, Bob. Bob can talk. <laughs> so you, you don't have to start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you tend to be random words in random orders, though. So. <laughs> um, but the yeah, zen um, style, the Zen approach to conversation. <laughs> it's the infinite monkey's approach to common sense. Yeah. There's bound to be something in there. Nobody's mentioned up. it. Nobody said a bloody word. Well, yeah, but that's yeah. pathetic. That's because it's par for the course for us, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. The beardy thing. It's I'm just too bloody lazy to shave and I'm not going anywhere, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that's very much the feel. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah, Thanks for, for anybody, anybody who's listening, can I just say, um, Rules of Combat, I'd recommend it. So we'll probably oh, okay. possibly put a link in somewhere. But yeah. Um, well, well, that's kind of you. But you know, book. I've got the DVD. I wish I bought I was. I had originally going to have all loads of books and videos in the background here, and I thought, Oh, even I can't do that. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll say, yeah, it's, it's, it's well worth a purchase. So anybody listening to this, get it. Rules of combat. Yeah. Many thanks. Okay. All right. No Take problem. care, my friends. I look forward yeah, to the next time. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.